Okay, I'd like to um, go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, and we'll have a roll call, please. Fitzwater? Graham? Here. Henry? Hussey? Here. Kimna? Here. Mahalovich? Here. Prather? Here. Schreiber? Here. Ward? Here. Weissman? Present. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Since this side outweighs that side, I think anything that we say vote on tonight, we're going to pass. They don't even get a vote tonight. <laughs> so you guys just non-existence tonight. Yeah, you guys non-existent tonight. Yeah. We'll come sit over there. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can entertain that motion to start with. <laughs> uh, before we start, uh, are there any items that uh, we reviewed, uh, the forecasts and the other budgets that you'd like to um, re-review before we proceed? Okay, is there anything from the um, finance department or directives from uh, you all? No. Okay, then it looks like uh, we're at the fire. Chief Schofield, I think you're up to bat. Uh, I'll just kind of mention a few things as they bring up the slideshow. I, I was able to prepare 79 slides. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. No slides. Yeah. <laughs> Did not prepare any slides, but uh, be happy to try to answer any questions we go through. I'm going to start out uh, with performance measures, if that works for everybody. So if you want to turn to that in, in the budget book, I believe it's page 128, if my book is the same as yours. So one of the things to highlight in the um, performance measure category for us is the, uh, the training hours. If you remember last year, we had a, a discussion and a pink sheet item that would allow us to compensate uh, firefighters who would be attending classes outside of their normally scheduled shifts. And uh, we kind of call that generically training wages. Um, and that's, you can see the outcome of that in 2017 numbers. And our six month numbers halfway through the year are almost equal to, in fact, they're exactly equal. I had to check that number six times. They're exactly equal to the, uh, the total numbers in 2016. So we're on track to double our training hours. And, and that's a, a, a big accomplishment. Um, many of the, um, Many of the classes that firefighters participate in are multi-day classes, and they're only scheduled to work a portion of those days. And so by, able, by us being able to compensate them on the days that they're not scheduled to work, um, that, that really makes it so much easier for them to attend and to get those very, very important um, training requirements and achieve those professional standards. So I just want to voice my appreciation uh, for that and that that is included in this year's numbers. Um, so moving on down, if there uh, aren't any other questions in the outcome category, uh, we'll move on down to the efficiency and effectiveness indicators. And the, um, there's a new one in there, and number five in that second category, total system response time, is actually a new measure for us this year. And what that incorporates that we haven't really uh, demonstrated before is uh, not only our travel time, not only our turnout time and the station, but the third piece to that is the time that the uh, call is received at uh, Jeff City Police Communications and then processed for us. So what that really represents is the time that someone answers the phone, the 911 call, to the time that the uh, fire company arrives on the scene. And that is the total, we call that total system response time. And so we, we started a conversation um, uh, really about a year and a half ago with communication operators and and talked about ways we could improve that response time because it does impact how quickly we're able to intervene in a uh, in an emergency situation so i think for us that's been a, a really positive experience we actually started driving that number down in 16 so you probably don't see the the true effect um, it's kind of jumped up a little bit i would say and we're having conversations now trying to figure out how we can um, reduce all three components of that time uh, to make it um, go to the achieve the the goal really the projected goal for us in 2018 of seven minutes 
uh, and that that's a very I think um, achievable goal but it's also a little bit aggressive for us to make sure that we can uh, try to drive those numbers down as low as we can get them any questions on response time travel time total system response time Moving on down uh, into the uh, the other categories, um, we continue to try to limit the number of responses that we make. We um, we try to do that in really two ways. Uh, one is the uh, the acuity of the call, meaning how um, how critical the nature is, and we've worked a lot with EMS uh, as well as uh, the communication center and the operators there to send us on ones that we actually have. Um, a, uh, a need for fire personnel to intervene. So we try to screen those calls better and we've, we've really worked hard with ambulance service uh, to do that. And then the other category is redundancy. If there's already medical site on staff, we try to, try to uh, encourage them to use on-site medical staff at facilities or institutions that have those because we're kind of a third wheel at that point. We want to avoid those calls and keep our our vehicles and, and personnel in service to respond to other emergencies. So even with all those limiting um, initiatives, we still see an upward trend in numbers. Um, I think we're trying to control that growth in number of incidents, but we're still seeing about 5,000 per year is, is the number that uh, will probably be uh, achieved this year and probably slightly more maybe in 2018. Other than that, um, one thing that may be a uh, cause for you may think concern, but I would say is not, is the number of public education and fire prevention events. You can see that in 2016, we had 261, excuse me, and uh, we only had 52 halfway through the year. And that really is representative of kind of our big push in the summer months to do public prevention programs at events like Thursday Night Live, kids events, outdoor <coughs> events um, throughout the community. But then a really big push comes in September and October for Fire Prevention Month. And uh, we hit every school and we, uh, we do uh, smoke detector installs um, and a, a number of other things. And this year will be no exception. I think that we'll well exceed um, that number in 2017 also. Any, uh, any questions that I can answer in the measures category. Councilman Hussey. I just have one on the uh, number of incidents. You said things are trending upwards, but that 2404 is really seven and a half months worth of data. Do you see a spike in the second half of the year usually? Actually for us, that's only six months of data for us. That's just six. You yeah, we, we kept, I'm not sure if we, we kept everything half, okay. half of the budget year is what we, we used for our numbers. So it's, we try to make that easier for computational purposes. Um, and I'm not sure if that reflects, yeah, it should have read for us, I believe it was May 1st. So usually our, our incidences usually kind of spread out equally month to month, or do you see a spike? We, we see some trends, um, but, but typically in the, in the form of structure fires and fire suppression, we really see those trends uh, jump up in the fall as people are starting to heat their homes okay. um, or, you know, fire up gas appliances that they haven't for some time and then there's also open burning and those kind of things i, yeah. I was just going to say you might end up down this year from like, like we might efforts to reduce incidents might be working yeah we're, <laughs> well we hope so i mean we're, we're trying so. we're trying to do that and then can i follow back up on the response time is there kind of a stand i mean the seven minutes is in the 2018 but is there kind of a a, a standard that you'd like to be at and then if we're not there yet, what's the cost associated <coughs> potentially with getting to that standard? So. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a really complex question, yeah. but I'll, I'll try to answer the best I can. There's there's two things that are not included in that what I call system response time, and the first one is on the front end. It's it takes a person to recognize there's a problem. You know, they have to detect that there's a fire, or they have to realize that someone's having a, a serious medical emergency, and they have to make that phone call. We don't know what that time is. It's very difficult. There's no way to really judge that. But there's that time that's really unaccounted for. And then there's the other piece of that, which we are trying to, to really acquire and, and track, and that is from the time that we set the parking brake and radio that we're on the scene, there's a certain amount of time for us to make our way to a patient who needs us or for us to um, 
stretch our hose lines and get water on fire. And so for us, that's a time that we think we can um, achieve or we can we can document and then work on. And so we just uh, had that conversation internally as a department about how we're going to uh, track that better and then try to uh, reduce that amount of time too. So when you look at that total number, realistically from the time an incident actually occurs to the time we are intervening to make a difference, realistically it's probably about 10 minutes. Just just to be you know fair and, and, and completely honest. So that's a long time and anything we can do to reduce even just seconds in that series of, of events, you know, we're going to try to um, capitalize on and minimize. So to answer, th there is some national standards. We try to apply those whenever we can. Um, but to make those numbers better, uh, there's a number of different things that can be done. Uh, strategic location of resources. Um, there is uh, efficiencies in, in design. You know, there, we always encourage, you know, the efficiency in travel, making sure we're looking at where the congested routes are, uh, making sure that we know our territory very well and can navigate efficiently through it. Uh, so th there's any number of things, and we're looking at all of them. Yep. Councilman uh, Kimna? Okay, Councilman uh, Graham. Yes, uh, Chief, I just have a question as it relates to uh, responding to incidents. Um, and I've been asked this question before, and I'm sure that others probably have too, so you get a chance to answer it for, uh, for on the record. If someone calls 911 or calls for um, the uh, EMS, mm -hmm. the f fire trucks, the big fire trucks roll to the scene, uh, what is the purpose of that if the EMT is already there and the fire trucks still have to have to respond? So. That's a good, good question, and we, we, we hear that quite a bit, too. And so um, all of our personnel are trained as either EMTs or paramedics, and uh, they many of them have worked. Like I used to work on an ambulance when I was in college, and, and many of them have as well, and some of them still do. Um, but we know that we can, um, we can usually respond and, and arrive about five minutes is our average. We actually ran those numbers about um, – about a year ago, we kind of did a little a trial study for about six months, and what we found was that the fire truck usually arrived about five minutes before EMS. Not in every case, but in most cases. And so we, we feel like that that five minutes is kind of a critical juncture, you know, in terms of, uh, um, I would say, life safety. And uh, we, in, in the emergency medical community, they say that time is tissue, you know, in terms of heart tissue, brain tissue, uh, bleeding control those kind of things so we feel like that that five minute window is critical uh, we, we also know that if somebody is having a serious medical problem it takes more uh, more than two people on that ambulance to really address that issue uh, it's not like TV you know it's, it's typically not as uh, clean or easy simple as it may first appear we we work very very well with the ambulance and support their operation once they arrive and so we feel like that's the best way to get not only a good outcome but also really really high quality patient care just as, if I could just as follow up you want to address the revenue piece of that yeah I, I sure can um, so as part of that we do receive um, an annual payment or have in the last three years uh, we've gone before the County Commission and as part of their funds for first responder services, which is probably the best way to, to classify what we do, they do, um, they do pay an annual, or have in the past, paid an annual payment of $25,000 to the city uh, for our support of that first responder program. Okay, because that's really the, the, the major question that I've been receiving is that, you know, why would you use this gas and right. time and all that to right. respond to an incident where EMS is already there and it's already taking, you know, they've already taken control of the situation. So glad to hear that there is a reimbursement that's that's being given back to the city for that. So, And I would add that most communities, especially uh, progressive, larger communities, uh, even much smaller than us, um, around the country have adopted a similar model. And that really has become kind of the gold standard and kind of kind of the expectation. Um, most folks we talk to say that it, you know, if they've never experienced it, they don't understand or comprehend. But, if, but typically, if they've had an experience, they say, "Wow, I, I never realized you know how important that was." Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Councilman Shriver. Uh, Chief, the, when you talk about the response time, uh, 
uh, sometimes when the uh, fire service is able to <coughs> be there before e EMS, there, there are those times when they're at a status zero, I believe, because of other transports and so on and so forth. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, it, it is. And, and at times there is extended response times for the ambulance based on any number of reasons. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So if there aren't any other questions on uh, performance measures, I think uh, we'll move on to um, the, uh, I guess, the pink sheet request. The first item that we had as the highest priority was a uh, an inflatable rescue boat, and um, for us the uh, the inflatable boat kind of serves uh, two purposes in the uh, fire department fleet, and it it really is the ideal tool for uh, rescue of of stranded or distressed personnel uh, in in a number of different um, water based scenarios. The boat that we have currently. Is um, is 19 years old, and it we've tried to repair it three times. Uh, the the inflatable boat that we have, and the last time we tried to use it, uh, we actually arrived on the scene and it wouldn't hold air. It was completely deflated. Uh, so so to me, I, I kind of made a personal vow then that I would not let that, that happen again. Uh, so that's why we uh, we put it as our number one priority for this year. Um, it. Uh, it also supports, you may think, well, we have a big boat, and we do. We do have what we consider more of a river boat, more of a metal flat bottom boat, and it works great on the Missouri River. What it doesn't do very well uh, is it doesn't do well in swollen creeks and other tributary waterways uh, because it's, it is very large, and it's the right tool for the Missouri River. Unfortunately, it is not um, at all the appropriate tool uh, for those other scenarios, those flood water scenarios. The, the good thing about the inflatable boat is that it can really be used both. And it's a best practice for us to, when we put a boat on the river, to also have a secondary boat available, if not close to, close by. So we, we really want to have this, this boat serviceable and, um, and ready uh, as kind of the backup, even on the Missouri River. And it's important probably to also recognize that in addition to rescue and response, we also assist the Highway Patrol and recovery uh, operations. Uh, we also uh, do some standby and public relations events. We'll be out next week with the MR340 as it comes through town. Uh, there's a, a lot of those events that, that we want to, uh, to be proactive and be on the river, um, ready to respond. But it's also, I think, good to represent Jeff City in that way. So we um, be happy to answer any questions on the inflatable boat. I might also add that I know the number seems high. I know that 35,000 seems like a lot for a boat, uh, but it's it's not only the boat, but it's also all the other accessories, the motor, the trailer, and potentially some personal protective equipment that comes with that boat. Uh, the other funded item in the pink sheet list was the uh, the copy machine. You know, this is one of those things I, I almost hate putting in a request for because it seems like um, I would rather the money go somewhere else. Unfortunately for us, this copy machine uh, has, has served its uh, use and its lifespan has been um, fully realized. In fact, even after we wrote this request, the, the maintenance guy came out and he said, I don't, I've never seen one of these before. <laughs> he said, I don't, even, I don't have parts for this. I uh, can't even support it. So um, it is unfortunately a, a high priority to get replaced, and it does get a tremendous amount of use. Are there any other pink sheet items that you would like to explore any further? Proceed. Okay. I, I guess my oh. question is, sorry, real quick on the copy machine. Are, do we purchase those kinds of equipment individually, or, or do we have a contract with a company to provide copiers, printers, and those sorts of things? And then. Well, it, it depends on what the different departments' needs are. Okay. Um, we we do uh, tag on to um, the the statewide contract, but you know, it just depends on what what they what the specifications are. Okay. We do bid it out if it or get three quotes, okay, usually good. for the price. Yeah, and I guess what I was thinking, sometimes large organizations you work with a vendor here in town that 
provides all your equipment, they service the toner. It's almost like you lease those sorts of things, but maintenance free. Yeah, that's what I'm looking mm -hmm. for. But and so like I guess I look at this and think like these are the kind of purchases that I, I didn't know if we were kind of monitoring these sorts of things on a citywide basis so that the purchase of a copier really wouldn't be a fire department pink sheet as much as it is some sort of operations pink sheet for the, the city. It's know? actually done through the IT department, but okay. um, the funding for it yeah. is, in the, is, is in the fire department. Okay. Thank you. And, and I have, if I could, on the pink sheets, one more item before we move from there. I have had some questions offline about the, the vehicle, and so maybe if it's if it's okay with the, the council, I'd like to maybe examine that just a little bit more fully um, and why it's so much more than other vehicles in, in the uh, in the budget line item. And you can see there that uh, it's a fire department vehicle replacement. For us, we, we also, like other departments, move vehicles around within the fleet and typically we purchase them in such a way that they're flexible enough that we can do that and that's how we get the life span that we need to out of them this would ultimately replace a vehicle that's 12 years old and so it's it's sometimes longer than others and the, while the miles may not be as high a lot of times our vehicles are idle on the scene especially a, a command vehicle like this uh, will go to a response and then and then be operational outside in idle mode so it's not really accumulating miles, but it is uh, still getting the wear and tear. The other thing that is different about um, our request than other departments is that it includes um, a number of different technological uh, additions. Radios are probably the biggest. Uh, the radios that we put into these vehicles um, are uh, not only mobile, but also portable. Uh, so there's, there's two types of radios. And for us to do what we need to do on an incident scene, we've got to control that uh, with multiple radio frequencies and heads in different places. And uh, that does make it very expensive. Uh, we also add uh, a command box in the back to carry extensive amounts of gear and equipment, um, flashlights, light boxes, uh, vehicle repeaters, uh, metal consoles, seat covers, fire extinguishers, the, the striping, all the miscellaneous wiring and connectors. So it, I realize the number seems high, and I guess that's kind of why I'm feeling the obligation to explain it a little more fully. Uh, we also use these to, as tow vehicles. So they, they tow trailers like a boat trailer, like any number of other utility trailers we have in our fleet. And, um, and typically they may have hard, heavy use the first three or four years, and then we try to rotate them to more lighter use logistical support. Uh, but by the time we get done with them, at 12 to 13, some, last year it was 15 years, um, they're used up and consumed, and we can't move any of that uh, equipment that we've put on there to a new vehicle because it's it's also reached its lifespan. So there's there's very little recycling that we can do, you know, of that added equipment. Um, be happy to answer any any questions on that if there are any. Yeah, Council Lady Ward. I don't, I don't have a question regarding that, but thank you for um, the information. Um, mine is in regards to uh, priority number five, the burn building. Mm -hmm. um, I know we had a lot of discussion last year in regards to, to that building, and I was just wondering what its current condition is, what you see its lifespan being, and if you think that that will affect the future of our uh, summer fire school training that's held here each year. I, I do feel like it, it's important uh, that that building's important for summer fire school. It's also important for us, you know, day to day doing fire training, and then regionally uh, as we host other classes outside of, of fire school. The uh, the problem with the building is uh, it really hasn't received much, um, even though it, it's received a lot of hard use. We've tried to keep it up and replaced panels. But when you burn inside of a building, it, it's very difficult to maintain over the lifespan that we have. We had a structural engineer look at it this year, and uh, his response was, you know, I can write this either way. If you want to keep using it, you might be able to squeeze another year out of it, but you really need to look at replacing it. And so that gave us a lot of concern. You know, it was kind of like, I might be able to certify it for you for one more year, but that's probably about it. So. Um, you know the full replacement of that building and again we separate the burn building and the drill tower they're connected 
they're all the same complex there at Hyde Park. But ultimately, we're going to have to do something at some point in the future. So is this amount for um, a Band-Aid, or is it is for replacement? It, it would be uh, for replacement of the burn building section, but not the drill tower. So the entire structure itself, you're probably looking at 600 to 700,000. Um, Joplin just built one last year for 20 million. So I mean, you can spend as much as you want, um, but for us to do what we need to do, that's probably the ballpark. We felt like this was a, a workable number based on some information we have. We probably haven't fully developed that number to tell you exactly yet, to be honest. <coughs> did you say 20 million? I did. <laughs> On a burn building? It's, a, it's an entire complex, oh but my. it's a very sophisticated training site, and it includes both Joplin police and fire. Okay. Yeah. 20 million. Wow. Questions. Um, so we can move on to line items if if that's yes, the pleasure yes, of the please. chairman. So really, not a lot of um, major changes in line items. I guess the only one that I would call out, which is a little more significant, is the um, the one that's on the um, clothing expense, and that one. Um, the request was funded by the city administrator and the mayor, and it's uh, for a $20,000 increase in that line item. And uh, what that would cover for us would be additional bunker gear replacement. The bunker gear, gear ensemble with helmet, pants, coat, hood, suspenders, and boots is about $2,500 per person. And so we try to keep those in good working order. They do have a lifespan. Um, and they also are more susceptible to um, uh, less protection as they age. So we have to keep those in good shape, and we've had a really hard time keeping up with 75 uniformed folks and all of their bunker gear needs. Uh, we try to clean it more often because it is it has been proven that um, bunker gear is a source of um, carcinogen contamination for firefighters. So we're washing it a lot more, which also uh, makes it um, break down sometimes a little bit quicker over time. It's just more use. We also train a lot, and we, and we do have a lot of operational requirements. So when you add all that together, trying to keep people in bunker gear at that price point uh, has been a struggle. So I, we are very appreciative uh, that that was uh, funded for the 2018, at least at this point, um, budget process. Are there any other line items that I'm sorry, you guys would like me to discuss? I don't see any. Go ahead and proceed. Uh. I think the other budget that's included in there is the fire museum, and that really just continues to cover uh, utilities and uh, the, uh, the basic natural gas, electricity, and water fees we uh, we are very very close uh, to completing phase one of that project we have a little more electrical work to do but I would as always welcome you out there it is uh, it is transformed if you haven't been in there even really in the last probably six months excuse me it uh, it's really looking good and I'm really excited about that project and I'm really excited about phase two of that project and converting the animal shelter old animal shelter into a fire prevention and education platform uh, do you have a uh, projected date when it might be a good time for us to go out there? We, I think we could schedule something anytime. Okay. As a, as, and we are kind of, I'll say that we're open by appointment. Uh, we still have a few things, like I said, we're working on um, to get to that point where we have scheduled hours. But we have hosted some events there, and, uh, and certainly we're welcome anytime anybody wants to come by to make an appointment. Is, is Captain Young one of your... Uh, uh, he, he's on our board, yes. On the board. Okay. He's a, he says, now he tells me he has 10 books left, and when they're gone, they're gone. <laughs> There'll be no more reprinting. So if you want a history book, you need to go ahead and get one. Uh, not a copy. Okay. The only thing I would say in closing is that we do recognize and appreciate the support from council for the, uh, the fleet replacement um, plan that we were able to put into place this year. 
and uh, I, I just I speak for the entire department when I say thank you for that any further questions for Chief Schofield I think you're off the hook thank you very much okay um, are we prepared for uh, plan, uh, public works or planning and protective services rather next well I think planning would be more prepared ready to go <laughs> okay very good Proceed. thank you mr. chairman uh, this is my first time to this exercise so bear with me um, I do have slides I have uh, eight accounts as you can see up here and I have about nine more slides after this one so I will try to make them um, short but to the point <clears throat> excuse me overall we have um, uh, four divisions uh, you can see them up there I'm not going to go through them but all together we have if you include a placeholder grant we have about 2.5 million dollars in our total budget um, including that placeholder grant which is our uh, community development block grant um, we bring in in grants about five hundred thirty four thousand dollars and then we also in fees and permits and things like that uh, cost recovery of about four hundred nine thousand um, dollars we have 24 full-time staff and two part-time staff there we go um, the easiest one is administration uh, three full-time staff myself and two uh, administrative staff uh, we support uh, the whole department supports several different commissions and boards throughout the city um, you'll notice in our budget the big line item that changed is we went from four persons down to three and that was basically a transfer from one of our administrative technicians from administration into the building regulations division we're trying to keep track of our cost and our cost recovery in that division that person has the same duties which were the majority if not 90 percent working with the building regulations division so the major difference in our administration budget is in that one item um, about 92 percent of this whole budget item goes to personnel cost um, the other costs um, are mainly under materials and supplies I believe that's about twelve thousand dollars total for gas and then we also have a uh, professional services contract that covers uh, a transcription uh, uh, for hearings and other items like that um, you can see the performance measures up there uh, basically the division directors rate um, my predecessor my predecessor myself since kind of split the time into there um, and we're looking pretty good there in terms of our actual uh, meeting our goals or exceeding them and I'd be glad to answer any questions on this one item um, if you recall um, planning and the MPO were uh, sort of uh, now under one position a planning manager uh, for budgeting purposes um, I believe it's still wise to keep them as two so I'm going to kind of cover them as two different items um, current planning and long-range planning activities are handled by this uh, division or excuse me this one account in in the planning services division um, it has one staff member about three-quarters of the budget is covered by that one staff member uh, the other expense uh, a large one um, is uh, the dues to the Missouri Regional Planning Commission uh, they do provide us a service they uh, uh, actually develop the Cole County hazard mitigation plan uh, on a regular cycle uh, they also administer and coordinate the uh, regional Homeland Security Council uh, at which we um, uh, pursue grant opportunities from um, they also work with the Chamber of Commerce on economic development activities and support them on various issues like that um, and then there's another uh, they're performing a, uh, a task that I'll get in later but they're actually working on it now for supporting uh, the community development block grant program um, let's see here now. Uh, another expense we have is advertising whenever we uh, have public hearings we have to advertise for Planning and Zoning Commission and to the council uh, sometimes that fluctuates quite a bit depending on if there's a lot of cases coming through or if there's not um, and then uh, other than that our budget is pretty much the same on this one item uh, you can see our performance measures are doing pretty good there in terms of uh, uh, staff recommendations being approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission um, and also by the City Council and I'd be glad to answer any questions or go through any sort of uh, line items Uh, the capital area metropolitan planning organization 
Um, that is a federally mandated um, uh, requirement for urban areas that have more than 50,000 people in it. Um, it's a multi-jurisdictional board um, that has representatives from Holt Summit, Coway County, uh, Cole County, uh, St. Martin's, Wardsville, Taos, all those jurisdictions are within the planning boundaries for long-range transportation purposes, uh, primarily for uh, monitoring and making sure there's public involvement activities with the expenditure of federal funds that may flow down through grants uh, to the local communities and also for MoDOT projects and things like that. Um, the Board of Directors, what they do is they annually develop a work program and a budget and that is approved by them and then it goes through this process here. Um, it is 80% federally funded, 5% uh, by Cole County uh, through a memorandum of understanding and then Jefferson City pays 15% of that whole $358,000. Um, there's three staff paid out of this one item uh, and I'd like to note that um, we're beginning to do a long-range planning activity to support our update of our transportation plan and you can see up there I have a little note saying $120,000 is being reappropriated. We budgeted money that we're not going to get to spend on a, on a consulting activity this year. We're actually going through um, uh, the selection process. Uh, we did leave some funds in that thinking that it may kick off in uh, September or October but probably not going to. So that kind of if you look at the previous years it kind of shows we had the 120,000 in 17 and now it's in 18 it's really one amount of money that is is, is just transferring forward so um, hopefully we will get back to some of the historic numbers that you see in the previous years uh, which off the top of my head are around two hundred thousand dollars a year for a budget as opposed to like 460 whatever it was this year or 360 for this year so um, that's what's going on when you look at those numbers there um, uh, most of the uh, uh, activities we do um, are for all of the jurisdictions in the area and I'd like to reiterate that the Board of Directors they're the ones that have approved what is being presented today in terms of the budget I'd be glad to answer any questions okay. I know it's not gonna be this easy is it <laughs> um, one of our divisions is a neighborhood let me hit the button here is a neighborhood services division uh, that has three different um, uh, accounts in it the redevelopment and grants community development block grants and property maintenance uh, which is also code enforcement um, so I, I'm going to go through um, the grants and redevelopment and uh, community devel development block grant and then I'm going to um, uh, for your ease and not have to skip back and forth in the budget book come back to the property maintenance one um, altogether we have six full-time staff and two part-time staff you can kind of see up there that we have a half FTE here and there um, the, the staff will work in one budget item and another so we have several people or a couple people that are split between line items so it's kind of hard to delineate one person really working in one area um, the first one is grants and redevelopment um, I believe y'all are familiar with several of the programs in Old Town we administer those uh, the solid waste uh, recycling contracts and ha household hazardous waste we, we deal with those also um, uh, the total budget is two hundred thirty-one thousand um, uh, dollars and one thing we did do in terms of the budget request this year and um, it, it may have not have been a wise thing to do since we don't have the grant yet but we we were anticipating applying for two grants and we're in the process of going to attend a workshop next week the uh, historic preservation fund uh, through uh, DNR uh, we're eligible and we're going to apply for two grants one is to actually develop a historic preservation plan and the other is to uh, do a historic property survey uh, that budget amount that we did request uh, is based on a previous survey that was done out off of Moreau uh, for that historic district destination um, and I'd be glad to answer any questions on this looks like you're gonna you're getting by without very many questions go ahead I'm ready for questions okay um council lady uh, oh I'm sorry. No. <laughs> um, you had mentioned the different plans. Um, I don't think you mentioned the South Side plan. Um, are you anticipating? The, the, in, in, in what regard? The South Side plan is, is, is has been well, a, but in planning and zoning, they've adopted it as right. part of the comprehensive plan. But as come, far as being able to 
implement and implement. do things. Yes, um, I'm sorry. I, uh, I got wound up and went so fast. Let me go back to planning and, and talk a little bit about the, uh, the budget request there. Um, sorry, I skipped forward. Um, we had two budget request items in there. Uh, one was an update to the comprehensive plan. Uh, that plan was uh, adopted in 1996. Uh, a shelf life of a plan like that, 10 years maybe. Uh, so it's twice, two and a half times its shelf life. Um, we had budgeted uh, about a quarter million dollars to do the plan over a two year period and we requested the first year's amount of money as one of the items. Um, the other item uh, was a, a, an additional planner. Uh, there are several items that um, we would like to actually address uh, with that additional planner. Um, if you recall, I mentioned we have current planning and long range planning. Uh, the long range planning is something that actually kind of gives away to current planning as, when a crisis occurs, a planning crisis, if you will. Um, but, you know, we have to triage what we work on. Uh, so, uh, this staff person in the past, and we will have more flexibility with what we've done with the planning manager uh, position. But um, the planner one, two position that we're looking forward uh, to possibly staffing would do things like the Capitol Avenue Conservation Overlay District. Uh, proactive things that are in these plans, and I have a whole sheet, I'm not going to read it to you, I can send it to you, but uh, things such as the South Side, as you are alluding to, um, there's, uh, and it was actually identified back in the comprehensive plan, there are several areas that are zoned incorrectly. We have a lot of single family houses that are zoned uh, multifamily, and that's something that's actually identified in the South Side plan. Uh, there are several items from the uh, 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 East Side Neighborhood Plan that we'd like to implement too. Uh, so we have a whole list, and I would be glad to go through it if you like, but um, there's a lot of items that would be proactive that would address a lot of the issues that we have to take care of sort of uh, when we get a call or concern about why is this happening? Well, let's go see. Well, it was recommended we do it way back when. We just haven't gotten around to doing it. it, it so, so basically plan implementation is what we'd like to pursue as opposed to um, we'd like to update the comprehensive plan and then also pursue more progressive implementing the items in the plan, previous plans. And that would address as well the, uh, the one issue that came up with the Central East Side plan about its adoption in 2004 or 5 and uh, the possible need for it to be updated. Yeah. Uh, uh, Updating the comprehensive plan, uh, if we didn't get the, uh, the money to actually outsource it, that's what that first budget request was for. Uh, the planner would help update the comprehensive plan, all the other plans. Um, hopefully the idea would be when we redo the comprehensive plan, we kind of take a step back at all these plans that are uh, adopted by, by reference into the comprehensive plan, like the east side plan and whatnot like that. So it'd be almost like a, uh, I don't want to say a clean slate, but we'd look at all the issues that have been arising from all these other plans being developed. Um, neighborhood planning is another one. Uh, you know, there's High Street we'd like to address. Downtown has no protections like the Capitol Avenue area, so someone could come in right now with the existing zoning and build a very large skyscraper. Um, if you can imagine if we were having the growth that Columbia is doing, what our downtown could look like without any of those protections in place. So through zoning, we could put in uh, those types of regulations and, and, and design guides for future building and what you can do with those properties too. Um, there's a, a, a lot of administrative things we'd like to address too. Our PUD districts, you know, you all get a lot of PUD cases. Well, when there's a minor little change in a PUD uh, plan unit development, that has to go through that whole process of planning and zoning and to the city council where it may be a very small change. We'd like to take a look at, at things like that that we might be able to present options to sort of unclog the pipes um, uh, in planning and zoning and the council. So that's what hopefully this planner would do is some of those more let's get ahead of the game type things as opposed to we're working on what's going on right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I believe I was here at uh, the community development block grant item. So this is the placeholder grant that I was talking about. Um, and and it, it's a placeholder because we just got our 2017 allocation uh, last month, or actually we're in the process of working on that now. So that's sort of the lag time. Um, 
the uh, the program allows us to do things with homeowner assistance, uh, assist, assist with down payments, uh, code deficiency issues, energy efficiency issues, um, emergency assistance for uh, folks that qualify. Uh, the program has to be spent um, on low to moderate income areas. The majority of the program has to. Um, the uh, uh, the amount is two hundred twelve thousand um, dollars, and uh, we do things. There, there's two classifications of, of demolitions in our world. One is voluntary, so this program also addresses voluntary um, uh, demolitions, which in the past uh, we worked very closely with Habitat. So when there's a, a house someone may do donate to Habitat, we may step in and help with the actual demolition of it, which helps meet our goals of providing housing to uh, low-income individuals and families. Uh, we also uh, recently, actually I think it's under construction now, uh, over on Broadway, uh, by South School, uh, well, North South School, we're uh, funding a sidewalk project so the children do not have to go across the street, over a hill, and then back across. Uh, so those are the types of things that this program helps fund. Um, we, we do have a consolidated plan. We will be updating that in the future. Uh, we do a lot of public involvement. How do people want to see these uh, funds spent? So um, we use that as input for our planning activities. Um, I mentioned the Mid-Missouri Regional Planning Commission. Uh, they're helping us with a report we have to do, the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing uh, Report. Uh, this is a similar to report to what we used to do in the past uh, that we actually uh, uh, consulted out, uh, but they're helping us with a lot of the legwork and we'll be doing that in-house. So we are getting some benefit from that relationship with the Mid-Missouri Regional Planning Commission. Um, there are no performance measures on this one. They're sort of tied in on the previous one, uh, but I'd be glad to answer any questions or go through any so a quick question. Councilman Graham. Um, didn't I hear on the news that there were some rumblings about uh, ending this um, CDBG grant? Yes. Okay. We, we haven't heard anything official, and that is why historically we've, we've, we've put that in as a placeholder until we know we actually get the funds. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we carry a balance from the previous year, which helps cover uh, the expenses that we're incurring as we're going forward. Okay. But uh, it's a very popular program with both Democrats and Republicans. Um, I'm not in a position to say what's really going to happen, but we're being optimistic. Um, our dollar amount did decrease, I believe, by 7% from the previous year. So yeah. It wasn't a positive conversation that I that I heard. Yeah. But, uh, Jamie Abbott may have some comments on this, too. Okay. Historically, the, the community development block grant has always been on the chopping block. Um, <laughs> The program has been a uh, a block grant since 1974 and has historically been refunded each year um, through the um, through the budget process. Um, 27 uh, or actually our 2017 funds were on the chopping block, um, as you indicated in the news, and um, it got funded. And we're, they're already talking about the 2018 budget. It's still um, right now is. Uh, being toxic funded so it, it just you know Congress uh, from what I read earlier today <coughs> went ahead and went above and beyond of uh, increasing funding for these HUD programs so I don't anticipate this program going away um, <coughs> anytime in the next year or so move ahead to um, uh, environmental health is actually the next item that uh, is in your budget book um, those are the uh, we have three inspectors uh, you can see all the activities they have up there but basically they inspect uh, facilities such as restaurants uh, uh, food trucks uh, when you have a, a vendor coming in with a carnival something like that uh, child care facilities uh, they actually have a contract to uh, uh, do uh, uh, various other activities with uh, 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 places that the state or the county might be responsible for um, inspecting. Um, they also um, uh, do building plan review for restaurants that come in to be sure that the uh, building is going to meet the requirements. Uh, they also respond to issues when there's outbreaks. They support uh, Cole County Health Department and the state in those activities. Um, they also administer or manage the compost site budget. Um, uh, that contract is going to, 2018 is the last year for the existing contract. We will be working on a new one. 
Uh, actually, we're going to have a lot of public involvement about what people are using and what their needs are with that so we can craft a, a more appropriate request for proposal uh, for that activity. Um, about half the budget is, is with that compost site, a little bit less than half, excuse me, and about 46% actually covers the, the staffing. Um, I'd like to note that uh, we appreciate the, uh, the new vehicle that uh, you guys approved in a budget request um, that is appreciated. And I'd like to note out too that uh, part of those uh, cost recovery uh, uh, that I mentioned at the very beginning, about $91,000 comes from the inspection fees that, that these folks do. Um, be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Property maintenance. Um, these are the folks that respond when um, I get a call or, or a email from, from somebody with an issue with weeds, vehicles, whatnot like that. Uh, a lot of our calls are on uh, uh, rental properties, but I'd like to point out the, uh, the numbers up there under property maintenance activities. Um, for all of 2016 fiscal year, we had uh, uh, 1,670 approximately uh, violations that, uh, that we wrote up and uh, uh, notified the uh, offender. So far through October through June, we've uh, addressed 2,064. Um, we're on track to uh, hit hopefully three, not hopefully, but uh, 3,000 since we're in the uh, tall weeds and, and grass season. So we have uh, done very well on um, our enforcement activities. Um, I'd also like to say kudos to our, our three inspectors. All three are now certified uh, to inspect the structure itself, not just the outside of the property. So they've been going through training and ramping up on that. Um, the budget is $331,000. Uh, we have three full-time property inspectors, uh, two part-time, and uh, this division shares uh, one FTE, an administrative uh, uh, position with uh, another budget item. Um, we requested uh, three different items here, and one was for more abatement money. Um, in the first quarter of this year, we spent all of our 2017 budget of $15,000. Um, you'll see that so far, uh, year to date, we spent $35,000. Um, we transferred money out of our demolition account to take care of abatement. Um, that is sort of the, some of the triage we have to do. Um, but you'll notice also that uh, while in 2016 for abatements we spent $37,000, uh, recovered $48,000. I mean, there's a lag time, we put liens on properties. But what I'm pointing out is uh, in so far this year we recovered $32,000. Money towards abatement has a good return on it because the process we go through once we actually abate a nuisance and place a tax lien on the property if the property owner does not pay for that. Um, so I'd like to point that out. Um, we also, um, our demolition budget, we'd like to increase that from $40,000 to $80,000 for next year. Um, we have five houses on the waiting list. Um, one alone cost about $6,000 for abatement of the exterior. We believe that one will be very expensive uh, to demolish. Uh, several of these houses are uh, full of uh, uh, trash and waste and things like that that actually could become more of a nuisance if someone gets in there uh, or they could actually be uh, noxious, if you will. Uh, but that's another item we requested. And then we wanted to also get ahead of the game and with the mailing, we wanted to be proactive and inform uh, uh, people out there, uh, homeowners, uh, 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 landlords, renters, of what their rights are and expectations in terms of property maintenance. And the idea would be we would uh, send out a postcard saying, here's the top five items that people normally have issues with that, that we address and hopefully try to make them aware that what they may be doing may not be allowable under city code and then sort of follow up in that neighborhood. And so we really want to try to reduce the abatements and reduce the um, uh, offenses that we actually have to enforce. So those are just the items that uh, we have requested and uh, just wanted to explain those to you. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Um, this, I don't know if this is covered under this budget, but the Southside plan, one of the recommendations was uh, occupancy permits have, uh, is that a resource issue or is that a? Um, that, that is probably a, uh, 
will of the council uh, in terms of we don't have an ordinance for uh, you're talking about the rental conservation mm -hmm. or rental mm -hmm. inspection um, yes and and one thing that that we're sort of optimistic about um, if something like that was put in place I would hope and I feel very strongly that our performance increase in terms of what we're doing with all the property uh, violations that we would actually be able to through efficiencies uh, actually start a rental inspection program without any additional staff uh, it might be good to have uh, some maybe technology or look at the process of how we want to pursue that but we're out there anyway um, it'd be nice if, if we could actually inspect a property uh, there's several different models that um, uh, we're actually going to that's on our to-do list is, is to develop a recommendation and go through the proper process but there's several different models of uh, doing a, a rental inspection program and I, I was talking to a gentleman just the other day to kind of get feedback he's a, he's a property owner he's just purchased several pieces of property in in, in the city uh, a lot of them may not be the what we think is the best pieces of property but I kind of threw the idea at him and you know got some feedback um, but I explained to him that you can be really hardcore in terms of what you're trying to do with the rental inspection program but I explained to him that we're just trying to address the issues of properties that are not safe for people to live in uh, y'all probably seen the pictures of um, light fixtures with water in them and things like that so once I kind of went through my conversation he's like you know that makes sense because that would increase our property values uh, some rental property might be converted back to single family property and that's one reason it was recommended in the um, uh, south side plan it was also recommended I believe in either the east side plan or the comprehensive plan so it's not a new idea and with so much rental property we really are going to be pursuing that bringing that forward to the appropriate committee and then to the council okay. of some of our okay. ideas good uh, Councilman Graham does Columbia have this program yes sir they they, they do and um, that is probably on the more stringent side they actually inspect every time there is a tenant turnover um, uh, when I uh, uh, did some work on a house for my father uh, I mean they even go as far as dictating what sort of electrical um, type of, of wiring you need to connect a dryer to to the outlet um, so that's probably on the more progressive more regulated uh, side but yes yes they do and I don't know how many inspectors they have we're actually going to try to have a uh, conversation with them to see actually more detail about what they're doing but they do okay Go ahead. thank you um, environmental health I covered and then I guess building regulations is the last one I have here um, one of the big things they've been working on this year is adoption of the 2015 building codes um, you can see under the ongoing activities uh, they do a lot of inspections and plan reviews and um, if you kind of look at the numbers you see as you get towards the end of the building process um, in terms of certificates of occupancy and that's one of our performance measures um, so the, the, the issue is we're not getting called out for these inspections um, we did request a, a plan reviewer to help us with our uh, 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 plan review process uh, we appreciate that being funded um, that's coming from two existing part-time positions uh, but we also requested uh, a vehicle which was funded we appreciate that um, but unfunded was a mechanical inspector and an additional building inspector uh, the mechanical inspector uh, mechanical code uh, hopefully will be adopted it's going to be presented as part of the building code updates um, to the council uh, but the mechanical inspector um, can actually uh, add value to the uh, construction of uh, or installation of the mechanical systems to buildings but then also um, that can be done through certifications through the installer or could be uh, 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 the consulting activity uh, but the building inspector would hopefully help some of this proactive and keeping on on track of, of people that are not getting the proper inspections but we are um, not doing too well on our uh, uh, certificates of occupancy so I'll just point that out to you um, they do have a, uh, a budget of five hundred five thousand um, dollars the cost recovery number of two hundred eighty four thousand dollars was actually for 2016 when there was only four staff that budget includes the uh, transfer of the administration uh, administrative technician into this budget item and also that plan reviewer so that uh, cost recovery would actually be a higher percentage that, that what you mathematically could calculate here. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions regarding this division. Council Lady Ward. Um, 
The line item on dues and publications, there's a $5,000 increase. Um, could you explain? I believe that is to purchase the 2018 building codes. Okay. Um, we, we, we go through a cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we're going to get those and start going through that again, but you have to have them to start right, reviewing correct. them. I was just, I the, knew there was something that was due to be bought. And, 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 and that also includes um, uh, probably a set of books for the plan yeah. reviewer too. Thank you. You're welcome. I do want to go back to the performance measures on uh, number number five. Um, it seems to me, I think you mentioned it, that, that our staffing levels uh, helped. From last year, we approved a position that, and, and I believe that you're at 43% of this one, and now you're at 64 and projected to be at 95 percent on the, the, the top one number five or item number five and that's useful because uh, if we get a question with regard to uh, <coughs> delay uh, it's this shows that that we're making progress and in some cases the it's, it'd be atypical for them to have a delay over 15 days or mm -hmm. something so I, I certainly appreciate this item and I appreciate how the budget is reflected in improving those items as as you uh, pointed out. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'd like to go back to, I had a question I didn't address, and there's one uh, on page 184, uh, number 11, uh, the difference in why that went down so much. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, my page numbers are not consistent here. Which, which budget is that? It's a, it's a, not, it's a performance, 184, uh, number 11. Oh, here we go, thank you, Public Works here to support so I'm gonna let Jamie answer this one because I'm not sure of why the reason the uh, cases pursued in court went down I'm gonna be real real honest here so our Springbrook uh, system, um, we have to manually count, um, you know, cases pursued. And um, so in 2016, I, overtook, I took over the division. And so how things were accounted for and identified uh, may have been differently how um, it was done previously. Um, so I, I do see in 2016, um, 122 and 2017 actual so that's through May um, so s that's seven months I believe seven months into the year um, I would s probably say is because we didn't really haven't hit the uh, the weed season just yet um, the May June July typically becomes our our uh, increase uh, summons and all that for individuals who are repeat offenders and or uh, the ones that we just cannot get to respond to our notices for nuisance violations so it's probably a combination of those two items okay fair enough thank you so you have some i don't know if you finished you getting ready to leave this one i just wanted to reemphasize that all to me all the positions are certainly important but the planner position um, here was probably my highest priority that was not funded so all the positions and all the departments are important um, but the planner one was important from a longer range perspective and, and many of the th things that Sonny mentioned I'm trying to find that pink sheet item. Is that uh, it's on the pink sheet on the, the big sheet, there's and there's a several page positions, page several page items, page you know, vehicles and people and all kinds of things. And I just want to make sure that that was, you know, just pointed that out. Not to the exclusion of anything else, it's just a matter of, of priorities with all the other things that are on there. Okay. Yes. That's Lady Board. Sorry. Um, and you may have addressed this already, but this year, how is our process 
going to go as far as um, if we would like to see something fund or, or funded, are we going to do a parking lot or are we going to do like we did last year and um, have a way to fund it by pulling something else? Or do, do you know that yet? It may, may be too preliminary to. Well, the, the observation last year uh, was that we, we started on the parking lot early, and by the time we got to the last department, we were kind of uh, out of uh, money and, and ideas, and, uh, and so we, we made the decision, I think, last year to bring up the parking lot near the end. So what I'd ask is that you ask the items that you want to bring forward and uh, please bring them forward when uh, we've concluded with departmental presentations. At least that's the direction I, uh, I'm heading in unless I get uh, a mutiny of some sort here. Yes, Rick. So does that mean there does not have to be an offset? No, I, I didn't say that part. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sooner or later there does. <laughs> yeah. I think we, uh, we, we, we let uh, people put things on and then give a couple of uh, weeks or at least a period of time uh, to find an offset. They didn't have to actually come up with it that night, if I remember right. Yeah. Okay. If we're all comfortable with that. I think we'll uh, proceed with public works. Is that up? Yeah, and, and as um, the uh, Matt Marash is on vacation, and I think timing wise, it's probably going to take a little bit more than 20, 25, 30 minutes. Um, Britt is here, able to respond. We could certainly go through it, but it might have to end up in the middle. So I don't know if there's some other shorter uh, budgets that uh, might be worth going over if, if you're so inclined. Well, um, Ms. Marash will be back next week. And sure. Um, don't do know if Margie's got some thought. Do we have any preparation for any of the budgets that are from finance that are items? Well, we can go through some of those small funds if you want to. There's not a lot to it. Uh, we so have two options pleasure. to do that or to uh, to adjourn. So um, what's the pleasure of the council? Okay. I think we got a green light to at least to hit a few of the small ones. Yeah, good. We're just warming up with questions, though. Well, um, to finish up the general fund, after the public works uh, tabs, there's the transfers and subsidies. Um, on page, it starts on page 245, and there you'll see the the transfer to the TIF fund and the transfers uh, for the airport subsidy and the transit subsidy. So, so just for make for clarification, you know that means that there's a, um, a hunk of money that's coming out of the general fund into those. Um, identified funds so it helps support general funds helping to support which is you know not atypical I mean uh, to help support those funds I have a question about that yeah, councilman Graham but that that was also to um, for like maintenance and all those type things was was part of that transfer funds as well did we put that to show the full um, amount of money is being transferred I'd, I'd say it sh it, it's to help um, indicate the full amount of money that goes towards the operation of that particular mm -hmm. department. Um, uh, transit, for example, and that's just for, as an example, um, you know, it includes the administrative fee and all the things that go along with that. So that's, so when we get to transit, you can see the full picture f of the operations r necessary to operate that particular department, the full amount of money necessary to operate that department, and of which these amounts are coming from the general fund to assist. So, so it does include all of the operation, the maintenance, and all those kinds of things. Understanding, though, that there's some um, items in, uh, for example, sales tax, again, using a transit example, to use um, uh, money to buy buses and those kinds of things. Okay. Um, the next tab that has um, an amount in it is the capital projects tab on page 248 and this is the um, where the uh, 
building or infrastructure sinking fund is at. So in 2017, it was 300,000, and in um, 2018, um, is 200,000. And I believe uh, Steve made a comment that he would like for it to be 300,000, but this is um, this is what was put in it for FY18. And I think that shows up in section three of our expense, and it shows up in the in the uh, per the forecast under the purple line. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got a question. Um, Councilman Prather has a question. So, is there a reason why we have a hundred thousand dollars less in there this year? The decision to fund it based on the available revenues. That there are other things that are more important than that. Basically, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Okay, um, if we want to move on to tab three, we can go over some of the sales tax, the capital improvement sales tax. Um, and we're, we're bypassing tab two because they're bigger, or you just um, well, uh, Mr. Marash will be covering the oh, airport oh, oh, transit those, and wastewater. Yeah, I got you, thank you, appreciate it. Tab three, mm -hmm. page. Um, so, sales tax F will not have a 2018 budget request that was finalized in FY17. And sales tax G, we've got $5 million. That's the annual estimate for that. Um, capital improvement sales tax and you'll see the projects that are outlined um, starting on page 326. I'll give people a chance to look at that. Three, page 326, the items on the lower portion of that. I'm going to ask a question with regard to um, any gleaning. Is there, uh, have we gleaned out, <laughs> I don't know what the term to use, of the previous sales tax? Or are there still some, some money available from the previous sales tax? That's true. And, and we're doing a reconciliation, but there are still some projects that are being, um, that are using the cash from sales tax F. Um, what we can tell at this point, it's going to be close to a million dollars. Now, is some of that uh, somewhat restricted to a project that the voters voted on, or, or is that in excess of the voter kind of approved? It items? would still have the restrictions of the purpose of the tax. Okay. Well, uh, I do remember one of the the ads for one of the sales tax, uh, and I can't even tell you which one it was. It could have been E, as far as that's concerned. Did say um, riverfront access, for instance, and that money was there specifically because voters voted on it back then. And I assume that that money is brought forward each year. Or it's still held out there. Prior sales tax dollars are allocated for those projects, and those are carried forward okay. by those particular projects am amounts. OK. And then, and then a deeper dive in this would, would specifically identify what projects those are going towards, right? I think Councilman, Councilman, so I think you're asking two different questions here. I think that the gleaning the million dollars left over is really an excess of project. Uh, the projects were completed as defined in sales tax F, right? And yet there is extra revenues just because the sales more. And at this you're point, it's not budgeted. You're referencing more. There was money set up the sales tax for a particular project. Those dollars were never spent mm -hmm. and so those dollars still sit there and so like the riverfront access but they carry forward yeah but they carry forward yeah. so they're that, restricted but the they're million dollars then is yeah. extra revenue from is, sales yeah, tax exactly how restricted it, is it uh, restricted in the context of the intent of that sales tax in the sense that but but some um, of that language is fairly 
broad as well. I think that's a question to an for us to answer later. Okay. If you're, if you're okay with that. I understand the question. I'd, okay. Um, so I, I thought we answered that one that one first, but I think there's there's some interpretation. I think some discussion. I think it's up to council's discretion on how to use that money over and above what's been identified for sales tax. But it probably takes a a little closer look at the particular sales tax that was approved. And then would we, as a council or a staff, need to sort of look at the projects that were identified and make sure that they were complete to a certain standard? Is that makes sense too. I mean, I wouldn't want somebody to say, wait a minute, you claim that you completed this project, but you didn't really complete it to the fullest extent that we thought it should be. We close out uh, projects and then, you know, when they're closed out, then yeah. that's where we look at the additional money that may be available for this gleaning okay. um, exercise. So I, I think the question becomes later on for council is how to allocate that gleaned money and, and right. for which projects you want to use that. And we had a discussion, I think, at Finance Committee not too long ago where um, several projects were uh, discussed. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Go ahead and proceed. Okay. Um, there are a couple of funds under tab four if you'd like to go ahead and cover those as well. The first one is the um, self-funded workers' comp fund, and you won't see very many changes here. I is it this is the one that we want to? Yeah, we earlier in the year we experienced a lot of claims, so um, we didn't make changes in FY18 for those things that are happening in FY17. So they're could be a chance of coming back to council if this uh, fund runs short. And on the projects that I just previously mentioned that were um, uh, given to, I think it was Finance Committee a number of months ago, one of those items was the Workers' Comp Fund on there. So um, it was identified. It's probably a fund that needs to be built back up for you know the purposes that Margie just mentioned. I don't want to jump ahead too much, but do we have a related item on Monday's council meeting? We do related to health insurance and wellness. So would, would is yeah, which is separate, from, different than this. Yeah, this is, the, this the is different than the workers' not, compensation. It's when a work when an employee gets hurt on the job. Okay, I thought this was the pool. No, this is this is a pool, but different than that pool. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Actually, it's the next tab. Okay, <laughs> the self-funded health insurance tab. Okay. You won't see um, a budgeted amount there because basically the, um, the every personnel section has that group health insurance budgeted in that line. So it, it is a, it, it's, um, the revenues are coming in from um, the employees share from the paycheck and then going right back out on, on, the, on the medical claims. So it's a wash. Um, tab five is parks, so we'll bypass that. One quick, I was oh. expected to see um, an unrestricted amount that cover that's the pool for the uh, for the uh, employees uh, for the self-funded insurance. Where I was expecting to see that item here, the, the amount of money that is restricted as a part of the pool for um, the self-funded insurance pool. Yeah, the these line items aren't going to show you what the fund balance is. There is a fund balance in, and it's a restricted fund balance for the self-funded health insurance. Is that what does that answer your question? Yeah. No, it's not going to be on. That's just general fund. And we've got the CAFR will reflect the um, the ending fund balance. And I, actually, I did an analysis for Steve that just this week, um, the audited FY16 fund balance in the self-insurance fund was around 57000 and at this point in time it's around 400000 so we're starting to build that fund up but our health insurance consultant said that um, 
um, according to standards, it should be around $2 million. So, you know, we've just started the self the self-funded health insurance, so we're gradually building up our fund balance. That's a good thing. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. And I think that's what's for you. We're, we're going to be asked to make a decision Monday on that. Correct. Okay. So did you want to keep moving on? Tab 5 is parks. Tab six has some of those small. You want to just get through them? Sure. See odd, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is the JC Veterans Plaza Trust Fund. You'll see two thousand revenue. And that's basically just interest, and then the the maintenance and the brick project for that is the two thousand budgeted under under the expenditures. The police training fund. We've got um, seventeen thousand one hundred in revenues and seventeen thousand one hundred budget for police training. And it's basically using all of the fund balance. We just leave a little bit in there. There's not a, a reserve in those in those in those funds. Is that um, is that the one that that there's a penny or a couple pennies for some sort of fines that attribute that go towards this fund, um, the revenue source for this. No, we spent down a training fund a few years ago, and it, it, the thinking was that it oh, needed there is to be some built back. Revenue from court costs. Is that uh, what you're referring to? Lodging tax fund is the next tab. So the revenues are a million one hundred thirteen thousand. We do keep some of that for administrative fee, but basically it's a transfer to the conference center fund. The city hall trust fund just has some interest income. Fireman's pension, no activity. Um, the USS JC Submarine Trust, you'll see some interest income there. The Woodland Cemetery, got some interest income. And then uh, uh, transfer from surplus of 4300 to fund the $5,000 ma uh, cemetery maintenance. questions so tab seven tab seven is the TIF fund questions with regard to that at least not now I we kind of ran through some of these fairly quick uh, and I wouldn't uh, if you have a question if anyone on the council has a question we can address them back at our next meeting um, or right now I think we're at a point in time where uh, we're I'm sorry I was just gonna say while well, mr. Smith is still here we could probably do airport real quick and perhaps parking real quick if you would like if not then that I'm sure he'll be prepared as well but those are fairly straightforward and I'd say go ahead we don't want to shrug you totally for tonight <laughs> I appreciate that and uh, uh, thanks for the deferral uh, I think the committee will be well served by having Matt make the majority of the presentation but I'm happy to talk about some of uh, some of the divisions of, of, of public works and the airport division is where we were going to start uh, as, as already been alluded to that it is an enterprise fund and uh, the uh, staff is comprised of three uh, full-time employees and then we have one part-timer uh, total operating budget is a little short of five hundred thousand um, dollars and we did have uh, two 
pink sheet items, uh, uh, neither were funded. One was a reclassification of a position from a maintenance worker to a crew leader. And the second was a replacement of some older equipment. Um, what, you know, I'm often asked, what does the airport do? And I tried to summarize it uh, here uh, in three bullet points. Uh, one is to ensure the safe operational environment for the more than 30,000 operations a year. Uh, that's uh, 30,000 operations, meaning somebody's taking off or landing at our airport. Uh, it is one of the busiest airports in outstate Missouri. Uh, we have more takeoffs and landing than Columbia, unlike, but they would say they have more emplanements than we do. So uh, it, it is a healthy competition between the two airports, but we support each other well. Columbia, Air, uh, Columbia Regional Airport, primary focus has been on passenger service, which is a wonderful thing for our region. Uh, however, we've been uh, focusing on general aviation, which uh, is kind of highlighted by our second one, is being responsive to their customers' needs, including the uh, owners of over 62 base aircraft and 14 privately owned hangars that are operated out of our airport. Uh, part of those hangars, a large part of those hangars are operated by a business, uh, Jefferson City Flying, which is one of the, uh, is our FBO, uh, fixed base operator at our airport. They do a wonderful business and attract uh, uh, customers from all over the state. They can work on every piece of the uh, aircraft, uh, whether it be a uh, Cessna, uh, small single, uh, small single engine aircraft through jet, through a jet uh, service. Uh, we actually have one of our base aircraft at the airport, which can fly nonstop from Jefferson City to Europe. Uh, not very many air, not many airports of our size can say something like that. Finally, we, uh, our, what I believe is what our main goal is, is to promote economic development and growth within the region. Currently, it's estimated that uh, uh, that investment of the general fund money uh, it ca uh, helps us to create more than $22 million of economic impact to the region. That's uh, a study done privately funded, or I shouldn't say that, it's funded through MoDOT. They look at all the airports in the state. Uh, with that said, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Some of our uh, outcome measures are a little difficult to report on uh, until the year is complete, but uh, happy to uh, answer any questions. Any airport and parking summaries are on the second sheet of your big sheet. Just no, so you I might that. add, uh, it seems like our jet service had been going up and up and up. So that, that, is, that is true. Uh, we were actually very fortunate to have an over $7 million investment through mostly through grant funds and rebuilding our main runway. And uh, that runway should service us many years into the future, uh, both supporting those jets, civ uh, civilian jet aircraft, and, and I didn't even mention our National Guard presence that we have at the airport with the, uh, with the location of, I believe, two helicopters that are based there and a King Air, uh, larger aircraft. Um, it, I, I'm a former pilot, used to be in the National Guard years ago. I can't, I, I, I will brag on the airport as, as every chance I get, so please tell me to shut up whenever it's, <laughs> whenever it's time to move on. Thank you. If you'd like to move on and, and talk about parking. Uh, the parking division, again, is an, an enterprise division uh, within the uh, department, uh, and, and it's an enterprise division that does uh, very well. Uh, we, we we're fortunate to have, uh, have this as a part of their downtown in support of our downtown. Uh, we try to run it as just another business, another small business within the downtown, and our job is to support those, that, uh, those businesses and, uh, that are located there. Uh, the operating budget's uh, almost $900,000. Uh, we did have uh, two pink sheet item requests. Both were funded in the mayor's budget. One is a replacement of a, I'm not sure that that's correct. Is it a maintenance truck? It's the John Deere mowing and snow removal tractor. I'm s And a mailing machine replacement. I'm sorry, I don't believe that that slide is correct. I'm, I might have made a mistake on that. I believe we only had two items that were requested. Uh, one was a John Deere mowing uh, mower and snow removal tractor, and the other one was um, uh, is for a portion of the mailing machine that replacement uh, here at City Hall. Uh, the maintenance truck and the enforcement vehicle were last year. My my apologies uh, apologies for not having that uh, slide updated and correct. Um, the uh, uh, currently, we're able to build a fund balance within the, the division. 
in other words, we bring in more revenue uh, than we actually spend, uh, than it costs to operate. That fund balance has been growing for a number of years, and the idea of that fund balance is to expand our uh, parking offerings into the future, whether that be additional surface lots or upgrades to our existing system or potentially a new garage. Uh, those, uh, we currently have a study out looking at our parking system that will be coming forward with some recommendations in the near future. What the division does, we uh, maintain a 540 space parking garage, 74 parking, uh, uh, a 74 space parking deck, uh, and then 14 reserve lot, 7 meter lots, and uh, 950 on street meters. Uh, we support a number of the downtown events. It's also my pleasure to uh, represent the city on the downtown association board uh, as part of my duties with this division. Uh, we do various things in support by putting up flags for the, the numerous activities that we have downtown. And then we also provide snow removal activities. Not only do we do, uh, remove the snow for our, our own facilities, but we have a contract with the downtown association removing the snow from the downtown sidewalks. That's, you know, paid, that is a paid function where the downtown association pays us for that activity. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilman Graham. Uh, Mr. Smith, think, since you brought it up, I have to ask the question. You talked about the uh, your fund balance. What is the amount in your fund balance? I I would have to defer to the exact number, but I believe it's in excess of four million dollars at the present time. This um, on the on the big sheets, the pink <coughs> sheet summary that you have in the back of your book in that little uh, pocket. The second, the first page is the general fund. The second page is the airport parking transit and wastewater page and you can see on the parking um, the FY16 audited fund balance total was six million three hundred and seventy one thousand eight hundred sixty nine um, of that there's a restriction of two million four hundred twenty four thousand four hundred sixty eight dollars so the unrestricted is is getting close to four million I revised my answer to say almost four million dollars <laughs> okay it's pretty pretty okay pretty good Good answer. What I know we purchased some lots. Is that we, we have purchased? Uh, we, there was a housing authority lot yeah. which uh, we currently ca we call lot 26. We purchased, I believe, two years ago, maybe three, um, from the housing authority. We were uh, we had been operating that lot for years with a cost share agreement where we were paying them half of our income. Uh, we ran the numbers and found that much more uh, to our benefit to just simply pay for that lot and uh, keep our revenues to, to for ourselves. And, did we, and we, we purchased that with the fund balance money. We spent that fund balance down to purchase that lot. We can get you that detail. I'm just curious. That's a yeah. what was restricted 2.4 million for. I'm sorry, what was the question? Well, the, the restricted. The fund balance is really almost 6.4 million, but 2.4 is reserved for something, restricted for something. I, I think it's best that we get that answer for you. I'm not sure I can yeah. answer that sitting right. here either. Um, so Sheila just brought up the comprehensive annual financial report and the, the restriction is $180,595 for pensions and net investments and capital assets of $2,243,873. Any further questions? Is that? Yes. Councilor Ward. Sorry. Um, this isn't, this is going back to, to another item that I had mentioned to you, Steve. Um, the mail machines that we're seeing on here, I think we determined that those aren't actual machines, but they are. Um, Allocations. 
allocations to use those machines? Yeah. Um, when I presented the IT budget, there was a pink sheet item that was funded, and I, it was brought forward by IT because um, IT does the mailing right. for the city. So that mail machine is, um, has, it's reached its useful life. And the, so the total amount of the machine is $15,000. So the general fund portion of that, that is in the IT budget of 8700 And then some of these other funds we've allocated depending on their usage of the mail, ma ma mail machine on an annual basis. So you'll see some in parks. You'll see some right. in wastewater and parking. Okay. So they're not separate mail machines. It's one machine, but it's just an allocation between funds. Okay, well his pink sheet funded second item says mailing machine mm -hmm. replacement. So I was just confused mm -hmm. on if that's actual equipment or if that's yeah. his portion of it's his portion of it, yeah. The eighty seven hundred dollars. And I, I think if you go to the the, the actual pink sheet it has that okay. in the description. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? <coughs> I'd entertain a motion to so move. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Or adjourn. Didn't need that side of the table to get that one done, did you? Oh, man. Yeah, it looks like he's gonna sprint out the door. Hello <laughs> <Yeah>. there. <laughs> Good job, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's perfect.